Welcome everyone to episode 16 of HR Leaders Live, a show where we discuss the future of work with today's most innovative and successful people leaders. The topic of this week's show is how to lead through change. And my name is Chris Rainey, co-founder of HRD Leaders and host of the HR Leaders podcast. As always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Joel Katz, CHRO at Assemble HR, who is just traveling around random locations as we speak, and uh, Matt Burns, CHRO at YISC. How are you doing, guys? Morning. We are terrific. I am here. Um, I am all the way downtown New York City, and I'm actually looking out at the river, and I can wave to the Statue of Liberty right now. Okay, thanks for that bit of info, Jill. So you're like our news reporter. Uh, today's special uh, guest is uh, Deanne Kissinger, Vice President, Global <laughs> Talent Management at Diverse. How are you doing, Deanne? What, she's like, Deanne's I'm like, what am I well, got myself you. into? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm doing well, thank you. Um, Deanne, for, for our listeners, let us let us know a little bit about yourself personally and your journey to where we are today. Yeah, so um, I started out uh, my career actually not in HR. Uh, I started off in the commercial side of the business in uh, pharmaceutical sales. So I was a pharmaceutical sales for a period of time and then uh, moved into sales management. Uh, for about five years, I was at a pharmaceutical company and then um, decided that I was going to go from drugs to alcohol and moved uh, from GlaxoSmithKline to Diageo and uh, led some uh, learning and development pieces and, and global learning and development for them in both in London and in Australia. Did some management consulting over a period of time and kind of moved from the commercial side of the business into HR and leadership development and talent management, performance management, et cetera. So had a couple different places that I've lived, like I said, London and Australia, um, Charlotte, North Carolina is where I am now and uh, leading talent management at diversity. That's kind of the really high level what my career has been. That was pretty concise. <laughs> that's pretty concise. You've done, done a good job there. We, normally, we have to cut people off and say, that's enough, guys. We've got to time. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> people there. So, so at the moment, yeah, and um, we've spoken quite a lot, and um, I'm wondering, I love asking this question, is uh, what are you currently obsessed with? <laughs> what are you currently working yeah. on at the moment and most, you're most obsessed about? <laughs> Yeah, most obsessed about performance management and talent management. And uh, there's a gentleman named Sandy Ogg, who uh, used to be uh, the CHRO at Unilever for a period of time. He was at Motorola for a period of time. And now he's really looking at how we match talent to value. And uh, he's working with McKinsey on that. And I've become familiar with him through Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches, which I'm also a part of. And uh, I'm obsessed with that right now because that is a, I think it's going to change the way we do talent management uh, moving forward and how we can really be strategic. So that's something that's, that's definitely got my eye at the moment and what I'm really paying attention to. Amazing. I'm interested in that, Deanne, because I, um, yeah. first of all, welcome to the show. We are, we are so excited Thank to have you. you. Um, and, you know, Thank Deanne you. and I, we connected a bit ago and Today, there are some incredible posts going on on, on LinkedIn. Chris, Chris put one up talking about how much we value LinkedIn and how much it's brought to us in our show. And I think you're a perfect example of us being able to find incredible people in our industry and in our field who can talk to us about things that the three of us care the most about. So we are super excited that you're here. Um, Thank you. No problem. And also, at some point in today's show, I do want to talk about um, Matt um, and what the new artwork is in Matt's office. So we'll get to that. It's important. <laughs> um, but I'm mm -hmm. curious to hear your thoughts um, right away, because there's been so much conversation right now about performance management and what is the right way to do it, what is sort of the old-fashioned mm -hmm. way. And the question specifically that I continue to hear is, if you start to move away from a formal review process, whether that become a quarterly process or not even a process on paper, how do you then manage year-end compensation? Yeah, that's a huge question. And I think that, that the piece for me that's difficult about that is if you are an organization that believes in pay for performance, and you differentiate. So somebody who does really well is going to do really well in their bonus and somebody who doesn't do particularly well is not going to do well in their bonus. How do you at the end of the year, if you haven't differentiated in some way, shape or form, documented it in some way, shape or form, how do you then 
as fair as possible, you know, enable people to, to feel like they're getting what's adequate for them based on their performance for the year, you know, and whether they've done a really good job or not. So I think that's the one that I'm still struggling with. I, I really haven't been able to marry those two things in my mind that you pay for performance and at the same time, um, you don't have a formal review process where there are you know, a, a, a formal way of saying who's done better than somebody else. Um, and I've been trying to look at different ways of doing it. We're moving now from a environment previously where we didn't even track the how. So it was all about the what. And so then last year was the first time we introduced the how around core competencies and around behaviors. And then I recently heard Marcus Buckingham talking about you shouldn't use competencies for performance. And I thought, ah, oh, I don't even know, you know, what the answer is there. But we're moving. We're, we're moving in a direction of looking at the behaviors and making sure that those count for something. So I don't know that, they, that I have an answer exactly to the question, but we're on this kind of path of moving away from, yeah, I, I think the, the thing that we all know is probably not good is only talking about performance mid-year and year-end, or even just at year-end. We know that that's not the right way to do things. So as much as we can start moving towards people getting more frequent feedback and feeling like they're actually a part of a good performance conversation, I think that's the direction we need to start moving in. Yeah. If I could just add something on that. Um, I guess first thing, just to remove the mystery around the artwork behind me, uh, I'm, I'm in Toronto today. So my team is split equally between Vancouver and Toronto, and today I'm lucky enough to be in the Toronto office. So that's the artwork behind me here. Um, in mm -hmm. terms of this answer, I, I agree with um, the previous comments. I think it's a really tough problem because we're balancing two things at the same time, and they're, they're contradictory. So mm -hmm. I don't think you'll meet a majority of people that will tell you that they love the current performance review process in their business. If it's annual, right. if it's biannual, if it's quarterly, most people don't like the, the task. The manager doesn't like the administration of it. The colleague doesn't feel great because it feels bureaucratic. And it feels like we're just rushing to the conversation around pay. Um, so it, it's, I don't know there's a lot of satisfaction presently. Having said that, the process that is in place today was created for a reason because in the past, when you have not, to our earlier point, when you haven't documented performance in a quantitative way, you open yourselves up to awkward conversations around equity, around pay, around performance, because someone will ask, well, I think this is about my performance, and you think this is about my performance, and there's a misalignment, and that just creates friction. So the solution to that problem historically has been, let's document it, let's make it really, really bureaucratic, and let's keep, you know, let's keep the waters calm, but as a result, the ceiling isn't very high. So one thing I'm looking at doing in the future, um, perhaps not this fiscal year, but in future fiscal years is, I love the model where pay is separate from performance in the sense that you would provide an annual cost of living increase depending on your market. You can do that quick analysis around how fast the market's growing in your place and around inflation, and you can adjust pay just to keep up pace with the market. Additionally, you can have additional um, incremental compensation for project-related tasks where that evaluation is completed by a number of different stakeholders in the conversations. That could be people on the core project team, that could be the person's coach, it could be cross-functional stakeholders, where you're getting this listing a lot of different pieces of feedback, and therefore it's much more um, tied to actual business results, and is tied to deliverables in terms of the in individual employee's contribution to the project. So I'm thinking through that, that's a model I'm really interested in, so I'd love to hear the group's thoughts on that. What are your thoughts on a, on a pay performance model that is more predicated on project life cycle and a cost of living blend as opposed to the traditional annual review, here's your 3% increase, I'll see you next year. Right, right. I mean, I would, I would jump in on that um, and first say that, you know, I'm at a training right now, as you know, and I want to commend you, Matt, publicly for being a manager who affiliates closely with your people and travels to be there in person. Um, I think that the, ch the fact that they get to see you and however your hair looks on that particular trip is probably impacting engagement significantly within YISC, and so I think that's really, that's really important stuff. Um, you know, I think that your idea is, is really interesting. I think that it is very progressive terms of, you know, connecting, quite frankly, the external concept of the gig economy and bringing it inside of organizations, because people are more and more interested now in project-based work, 360-degree feedback, working with teams and moving from project to project. 
I like the idea of managing merit or cost of living on its own so that it's just, you, you know, you get that pay because it's part of your living expense. I also like the concept of compensating based on specific projects. The question I would pose, and I would love to hear Deanne's thoughts about it, is it becomes a very complicated process on the back end. So I imagine that in like that together, you need to figure out how are those decisions going to be made? How much time during the year will then have to be devoted to figuring this stuff out and creating proper allocations? How does the budget work? So all of that machination feels hard, but I think that that my immediate response to it and that that could be a model that three years from now is super intuitive and thoughtful and there are probably going to be multiple um, answers in the marketplace to help with that kind of, that kind of process. Yeah, yeah. And I think that just thinking through that as well, when you, you imagine some of those projects that people are working on and how would you prioritize the projects? Um, when I was referring to for, before about the talent to value, it's all about the strategic goals for the organization and finding a dollar amount or a pound amount or you know whatever your currency is that you can actually assign to each one of those goals and then figuring out who are the critical roles that need to make that happen. And so I, what we're doing right now is trying to determine what are critical roles that are aligned to our strategic goals for the organization and not everybody's a critical role, you know? Uh, there are very few critical roles that you actually need to make that happen. And that's not necessarily an easy thing to, to go through, you know, when you've got, and it's not always the senior leaders in the organization. In fact, a lot of times it's a little bit deeper. Those are the people who are making the impact. And to tell a senior leader, I'm sorry, your role isn't a critical role, but your direct report is, doesn't always land as easily as you might think that it would. Um, but uh, I think that's one way of thinking about it is you could potentially, and this is just kind of us maybe brainstorming a little bit, you could potentially have those projects in a priority order based on what their strategic goals are for the organization. What you'd have to manage on the flip side is if somebody's in a project that isn't a strategic goal for the organization, how are they compensated? Are they gonna like the fact that they work their tail off for the year but I'm sorry, your goal isn't something that's strategic for us, so you're not gonna get as much you know, of the, the pie at the end of the year. That, that could be a difficult conversation to have uh, and keep people. So that, that'd be an interesting one to, to try out, yeah. Here's what I would offer in terms of some additional context. So I, I agree with everything that's been said, I guess, and this isn't a, a comment about anybody on this particular conversation, but I would say is, I think a lot of times we're viewing programs from the back end perspective, and I think mm -hmm. that's the wrong way to look at it. So ultimately, we've created programs in HR that work really well for us because oftentimes we're under-resourced, we're not a revenue-generating function, so we're constantly fighting for headcount and resources and budget and wages and things of that nature. So we create programs to achieve the organization's expectations on scale with limited resources, and the best way you do that is by being really, really efficient. And that's how you end up with performance management on an annual basis because it's really, really efficient for us to manage that process. It's not pleasant for the managers, and it's not pleasant for the colleagues. So I, I understand the question regarding the, the design. I think the way I would propose it looks like is, I think the what's pretty easy to mention. So you can establish in a project individual deliverables by project team member. So whatever function you're gonna perform on that project, whether you're a project manager or a change manager or a subject matter expert or part of the implementation team, you'll have deliverables that are kind of yes or no quite answers and you'll be able to assess those by way of the project. I think the more difficult thing to manage, I think what Jill was mentioning was, is the how. Because now the how becomes really subjective and it's predicated on feedback from a number of different levels in the organization. Um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying it's something that's not traditional in a lot of organizations to ask peers or ask people that may report to you for feedback as part of this process, I think it should be more prevalent. Um, so I'd want to make sure that if we introduced a program like that, that, there was a lot of communication and training and support to all the members of the organization around that because the last thing we want to do is disadvantage somebody due to a lack of understanding when the goal really mm -hmm. here is to provide performance that is specific to the individual deliverables. So I think that at times we risk creating performance objectives that are macro and they're organizational in nature, and the employee struggles to connect themselves and their day-to-day -day performance with that goal. So I like the project piece of it is, how do you tie in what you're doing day-to-day -to, -day 
to the organiz organization's contribution and to the earlier point, you hope that those projects are driving strategic goals. So therefore, you are measuring the employee's impact on the strategic goal in a really personal way and not making it more opaque where it just leads to confusion and leads to conversations and in some cases leads to disengagement because of a misalignment of expectations and of the perception around results. Um, it won't surprise anybody to hear that it's commonly known in our industry, and I'm sure the outside of our industry, people consistently overrate their own performance. Mm -hmm. That's just that's just a reality. So you're you're starting from a you're starting from a position already of somebody who is going to view their performance in a different way than perhaps you will. So I think it's just so critical to be clear up front on what you're going to measure, how you're going to measure it, what's the process look like, so that you avoid a conversation or conversations down the road where there's that misalignment. I think that's where the attention needs to shift, as you guys you just said, of, of the training of the, of the leaders and, and companies aren't spending enough time actually supporting their leaders and giving them the tools and the training they need to actually help this. And this isn't like a, a one-off training where you go there for a day and have a half day training and that's it. <laughs> that also needs to be ongoing as well, because if you think about, you know, from my perspective, going from the annual, annual year review to a continuous feedback, that's a huge change. <laughs> a huge shift for people um so it's gonna the, the support that i think that's the really the, the, the fundamental part and I, that's why i wanted to ask you dian i know you're going through a similar sort of transformation i'm just wondering how you're working with your leadership team the level below and then what kind of support are you providing them to help them through that that shift mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now we're also at the same time getting ready to launch our new core competencies. So that's the how piece. Uh, so there's a lot of piece, uh, pieces moving at the same time. We're getting ready to do our, our mid-year. We're, we're moving more towards quarterly, but this would be the mid-year review. And at the same time, we're creating our core competencies that people will be uh, using in their discussions with their manager and then at the end of the year to be evaluated on. So we've got a lot of, of pieces moving. I often say that I feel like I'm building a bridge as I'm walking across it. Uh, and, and so that sometimes uh, means that we have to create programs that are really quick and really effective really fast, you know, to, to Matt's point about being really efficient earlier. You've got to do that really quickly. So the things that we're trying to make sure that we do is number one, communicate uh, as effectively as we can about the why. Why are there competencies? Why do we do, um, you know, more reviews during the year instead of just one or two? Making sure that our communications include the why. And then also helping managers by providing resources that they can read or they can watch or that they can interact with, you know, in many different ways that people learn to start going through the process of what does a performance management or a check-in, like we're trying to keep them really you know, succinct and, and really focused. What does that look like and what can I expect from that? So uh, really trying to put that stuff in the place right now. It feels like it's, you know, it's already June, uh, end of June, getting into July. So we're, we're moving really fast in doing that. But that's some of the stuff that we're trying to create for employees to help them through the process and help them through the change a little bit. We were speaking before about who should be leading the change, whether you go mm. top down, bottom up. Can you elaborate on that and what your thoughts are on that? Because I think that's very interesting. Yeah. So um, I, the way this all kind of came up was that I went to the ATD or Association of Talent Development um, conference back in May. And there's a guy named there named Jack Zenger who was talking about uh, leadership development and specifically and this idea of herd immunity. And what he was saying was, is that a lot of times organizations will put in place all these different programs and, and processes and only put a couple people through each one of those rather than doing one or two really well and getting a mass of people who are, who are um, you know, participating in the new way of either learning or leadership development or change in some way, shape or form. And so I thought about that for a bit and I thought, I don't know if our programs actually have a massive impact. You know, I think that they, well, I think they have an impact, but I don't know if they've got the mass as in the literal term mass impact, you know, where we're actually reaching a whole bunch of people um, at a certain amount of time to be able to, to build the change. And the way we've approached it in the past and the way I've thought about it is, you know, you start with a change, you start at the top and you help them start to, to share it with their team and they share it with their team and there's this cascade and people will see their leaders acting in a certain way so they will feel more comfortable acting in that way, etc. And is that the way that we should actually um, do things when it comes to leadership development as well as change? Because if you start with the mass then, and I know there might be a hurdle for them to push up, but at the same time, you've got a mass. You know, you've got, um, Peter Drucker says, at least you need to have like two thirds of the people you know, uh, affected in some way by that. 
maybe that would help the change go quicker as opposed to trying to, to trickle from top down. And the way I was thinking about it as well is the people at the top have been performing in a certain way for a, a period of time, right? They, they usually pretty accomplished, they're further along in their career, and um, you know, they're, they're used to working in this one particular way. And, and I guess for people who can't see, I'm kind of making this you know, um, wheel of motion. And we're asking those senior leaders to now shift just that little bit, turn that wheel just a little bit to the side and make it go. And that's a huge shift for people who've been acting and getting success at a certain way for a long period of time. But if you start closer to the bottom in mass, it's easier to get people to make that little turn of the wheel because they don't have all of that history behind it and that momentum behind it. So that's kind of what I was thinking about. And I'm just curious about the rest of the group and what their, their thoughts are on, you know, do you start at the top? Do you start at the bottom? Does it matter, you know, what kind of initiative you're, you're starting and, and what the thoughts are around that? Well, I have thoughts on it, but I would never want to um, take so, um, Matt, why don't you share your thoughts and then I'll, um, I'll critique them. So like the other 15 shows we've done. Um, so I, I like the idea of a ground up change initiative. I struggle to view its practicality when I know that it's going to get quashed potentially by the senior leaders in the organization. So I, if I think, if I ask myself what's more important, executive sponsorship or organizational alignment at the, at the front line, to me, I would say it's executive sponsorship because ultimately they're the individuals who are controlling budgets, allocation of resources, strategic priorities, business transformation. Um, I think ultimately the answer is you need both. And I think you can start the activity of change at that at frontline level, but I think it's predicated on having at least some conceptual alignment from your executive group around where we are and where we're going. Um, but I think you can make a stronger investment in that ground up change management effort, whereas traditionally it's come down through a waterfall. So it's come from the senior leaders, they communicate to their direct reports, who communicate to their direct reports, or playing you know, a broken telephone where the message started here and now it's ending up over here and it's very different than where it started. So I think that is a challenge in today. So I love the idea of more of a grassroots type of a movement. Um, uh, I just, I would say is, I don't think you can do that without having executive support. So if I have a choice of one or the other, I'm taking the executive support. Mm -hmm. Jill? Hey, that comfortable and agree with that. I don't know what he just said. Jill, you may, um, Jill, you may need to pick up your phone because we can't hear you too well. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I think your speaker's on the desk, so we couldn't hear you probably, but now we can hear you. I think, I think it was hard for you to hear me because I said I agree with Matt. Who <laughs> <laughs> um, lost connection. <laughs> I know. I know. Something is, something is wild in downtown New York City. Um, I, I agree with Matt, but the one thing I think I'd add is I don't think, it's, I don't think it is um, mutually exclusive. I think that as we, I think as we go into the future, the best initiatives are going to be the ones that are actually co-owned and co-sponsored by the most influential voices in the organization. And I think that those would be pods of people that are top senior executive roles and also strong influencers within the organization at all levels. Um, and so I think to get something up and running, you actually have the ability today um, through technology, through all, all of the ways that culture is changing to have a C-level person and uh, you know an analyst or a manager or a director all on the same committee pushing for something that everyone believes in, which allows you to call it corporate, it allows you to call it grassroots, it allows you to really kind of touch on everything. Um, and what I, what I would put out there, and I, and I think this comes up a lot in our conversations, is that one of the biggest changes I see in the field is that it is no longer about performance management or compensation or, or benefits or, or leadership development. It is actually about culture. And, you know, we've talked more and more on this, on this show that almost any topic today really does lead back to the middle, which is what is the culture you're creating? Because that informs what your performance process should be and who should be involved and who the mm -hmm. decision makers are and what your methodology should be and then how people expect to be compensated and recognized, et cetera. And so 
I constantly talk with my clients and, and my colleagues about you can't start at performance. There's a client I'm working with right now who just wants me to help them revamp their performance process. And I continually mm -hmm. say, it's not about your performance process. It's about your company culture. And until we know who you are and how you want to live your organizational lives, you can't really have a performance process that's going to sustain over time. Yeah. 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 That really resonates with me, Jill, because um, diversity, uh, we recently separated. Uh, it's its own company now. And so we feel kind of like a startup to a certain extent. And we have new processes that we're putting in place. And it was exactly that, that piece that hit me that we can't actually focus on just one. We've got to look at who we want to be as an organization and start putting that kind of foundation and framework in there. You know, do we want to be a company that differentiates? Do we want to be a company that is um, innovative? Do we want to be a company that cares about um, employees, cares about the environment, cares about, um, you know, our, our customers and stakeholders? And if those are the things that we want to be, what does that mean then for what our performance management should look like and what we reward and what our talent management processes look like and what we're focusing on in leadership development. And so that's been something that's been really important for us to figure out and we're still figuring it out. But I think, you know, to your point, if you try to focus just on one, unless it's woven within the fabric all around it, it's never going to succeed to the extent that it could if it, it's in, in alignment with the whole culture. You know, So that's a, that, that really resonates with me what you just said there. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, I have exactly one minute before I jump off the show today, but I have a job on the show. Um, my Pick up your phone, Jill. <laughs> we can't hear you properly. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. There, you go. Um, there, you go. there we go. I said, I have to jump off the call in exactly one minute to go back into my training if I want to be certified. Um, but I... <laughs> but I do um, play a very special role on the show. Um, so the first thing is, in terms of the three hosts of the show, I am always the smartest woman. Um, and <laughs> the, the second role that I play on the show is that I ask the question that is the hot seat question. Mm. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask the hot seat question um, and then I'm going to ultimately jump off. Um, and I'm going to direct it to Matt. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. I appreciate it. I'll pay you later. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the hot seat question is, in nine years from now. Wow. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> and it's not, that's not 10. <laughs> in nine years from now, when we look back on this particular podcast, what, what will be the thing that we completely missed that has become so obvious and so typical in company culture? Mm. Wow, thanks, <laughs> thanks That's Jill. That's a very good question, yeah. And then right. she leaves. And then she leaves. And then she, goes. All right. and then she just drops the bomb and walks away. All right, you know, so, uh, we call this we call this a mic drop. I'm going to show you all what it looks like, and then I have to go. Don't, don't, don't drop your phone. On. <laughs> yeah, me, me, me and Matt thought the same thing. But like, don't drop your phone. All right. Good we luck know to her you. too well, Chris. Yeah, I know. She would mm -hmm. literally would drop her phone. <laughs> so, drop. See you later, Jill. Thanks, Jill. Bye, guys. Thank you. Matt, you can give the Dave Ulrich response to that question, which was, if I knew that, if I knew that question, <laughs> then I already would have done it. <laughs> which is no, I'll play the game because I, you know, I, I worry that if I don't, that Jill's going to up her uh, harassment of me on this, on this show. So I got I to gotta play, the, I gotta play the ball. Um, so I think a couple things that I don't think we've talked about already. So um, I think the first one is technology. Um, so we've, we've danced around technology, but I think technology allows us to address some of the concerns that we brought up around scalability and around um, accessing different stakeholders in the performance management or the change management process. So I think technology goes a long way to doing that. You can give real-time feedback to people. You can give real-time uh, advice and perspective to people with collaborative tools nowadays. So there is an opportunity to provide use technology as a means of enhancing the performance management process and moving away from that annual review cycle. Uh, the second thing that I don't think we've mentioned a lot of it is uh, the peer-to-peer -peer aspects of it and the idea of individual employees on the line reviewing each other. Um, maybe it's not shift by shift, but on a regular cadence so that 
we start to assess an employee's contributions to the organizational's culture at the frontline level. So right now, from our organization, it shows up of how are you living the culture from my interpretation, from a senior leader's interpretation? And oftentimes, that's not reality. So I would love to see more, you know, nine years from now, more conversation from peer to peer type assessment. How are they contributing? How are they pulling on the rope with their peers next to them at the front line, um, along with how are they supporting the organizational most broader objectives? I've seen a few really interesting uh, apps pop up recently on, on in the HR space with exactly that focus, Matt, where you basically have a score, but it's really not just from your, your, your manager, but it's from every, everyone in the organization. And it get, even in the business, you can actually search the, the, the tool to find out performers in particular that have been rated highly in particular competencies by their peers, by their manager, by also by people outside of the company, yep. the clients as well. And people like, so, so you both have the, the internal perspective, the management and externally, um, even to, to the point where they can bring in data from previous roles, which is crazy. <laughs> I think which just blows my mind. And, and, so and you, you can tie it well. to recognize. Yeah. And you can tie it to recognition programs as well and then reward people on an, on an, on an informal or a formal basis on a more um, regular frequency. So I think it opens up a lot of possibilities with collaboration tools. You know, I agree with you. I think they are there, but I don't know that they're at critical mass yet. So no, I think no, if we no. look back, that yeah. will be something that most organizations are operating in under is the time, idea of collaboration. Yeah, in nine years' time, I think that'd be common practice. And I don't think, we've, we, we speak about it all the time, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be alive to have the tools that we have at our fingertips to communicate with our employee. You know, I'm not saying replace the face-to-face -face meetings with technology, but I'm saying in terms of the ability to reach your employees on scale is incredible. Um, we always talk about the podcast, Matt, as a platform. I always say every, every company should have a podcast. It's an amazing way to communicate with your, 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 your business and your employees, your, your customers, and deliver that message in, a format people want to consume <laughs> they don't well, want to go on an intranet to find out the latest information <laughs> it'd be so much better to do that and to use a personal example chris we've been talking for what nine months now yeah we've never we've never met we've never met <laughs> that's true yeah. we're sure mm -hmm. you know, every single week right we're on a show together and we've never met and it, but yeah that's that's a great example that's that, it doesn't even feel like we haven't met it's uh it's, it's quite weird now whereas it, but in the past when you did a video <laughs> call it was a novelty you did a video call now and again, and it was like, you know, a very bad connection. It was annoying half the time. You didn't want to do it again because you lost the call five times um, as well. But now it's just common practice and a, and a way to do that. You're right. I didn't even think about that, Matt. I feel like we've already met. And even, you know, Deanne, we met, we, we were speaking by yeah. LinkedIn. We, we've, this is the first time we've ever met, but it feels like you already have that connection mm -hmm. beforehand um, as well. So yeah. certainly. Uh, are you using any platforms you know you mentioned earlier about your you have a way to how you you said you had a few videos and stuff like that, that you're helping to educate your managers and your leaders is that just for an internal yeah. platform you built or is it something you yeah we with? just uh, we don't have any um, things that we built ourselves, but we use WebEx a lot. Uh, there was a platform uh, that we used to use at, at Sealed Air, which is called On24, which is a great platform as well to be able to reach. We have such a global audience. We have uh, about 60 different countries that we're located in. Uh, so all across the globe, which makes it difficult to do things um, you know, in real time sometimes. So it makes it a lot better if you've got a platform that makes it feel engaging, interactive, and enables people to engage with it, you know, and, and what fits in their time, you know, and in their time zone. So that's uh, what we've been looking for is ways to be able to do that in a more effective way. Mm. Well, to the question to both of you um, on the topic that we just discussed, what, who, who are, who's, doing this, who's doing this well at the moment? What companies that you guys are looking at out there that are, are leading the way in this space, just out of curiosity? Because there's so much going on. And I'm just wondering if there's anyone that our listeners can look at as a, as a benchmark and perhaps a case study to have a look at, see what they're doing. I've been yeah, doing a lot of research this? lately. Sorry. Go ahead, Deanne. Oh, go ahead. I was going to clarify that question. You mean in the, the perpetual feedback kind of yes. way? Or in terms yeah. of reaching? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I Matt. Clarify. Go ahead. I, I should have clarified that. <laughs> Go on, Matt. You're up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I have I have two I've been looking at, and, and before I say that, I'll just I'll preface this by saying that I look for leading lights in the industry across multiple functions, and then I try and rationalize it for my business, which is a retail business, because oftentimes of the budgets are very different. So, two companies I've spent a bit of time looking at lately around performance management are Netflix and Zappos. 
Um, both, I think, have really interesting views of how they view culture. And we talked about culture a lot on this call. Culture is at the centerpiece of both those organizations and how they view everything from the selection to the orientation to the learning and development. And then, of course, to the ongoing performance management and change management in the organization. So I think to answer your question, Chris, I would say those two. Um, and then what I do is I look at some of their best practices and I try and rationalize them for my audience. And how can I do this million dollar idea for a hundred dollars? Uh, and that's really most of my job is how do I do a million dollar yeah. idea for a hundred dollars? Yeah. Um, and more often than not, I can get pretty close. Like I can get 80% of the way there for a hundred dollars, but it just won't look as pretty. It won't be as savvy. You're not going to see our organization splash in the front of, you know, Forbes magazine for innovative approach, but we can often do it on a shoestring budget. So I'll give you an example. Um, we spend uh, a total of four figures, four figures, on our annual employee survey, which involves 1,500 employees. Most companies spend five or six figures on their employee surveys for that many people. We spend four because we've struck, we broke it down to what is absolutely critical, which is we put out a decent survey, we solicit feedback, we contextualize the feedback with town hall meetings, and then we take action and communicate the heck out of it. So we simplify what can be a very robust, expensive, time-consuming. Takes two, three months to do. <laughs> yes. yeah. And then the most important output is the executive deck you get from the vendor and you take that to the executive, you walk them through it. Like that's like the big performance when you share it with the colleagues and big companies. It's like, well, yeah, they can know too. But the real audience is the CEO and the CHRO and different people of that nature. We simplified all that and said, get rid of the bureaucracy. The important thing here is the employee feedback, us taking action against it and letting them know what we're doing. And you can do that mm -hmm. relatively inexpensively compared to these big, monster programs yeah interesting right right yeah and for me i don't have a specific company that i've been looking at i've been trying to pay attention to the trends and to see that to a point that we were making kind of earlier is the startups you know looking at what they're trying yeah. to do because they are nimble they are fast moving they are trying to sit on the edge of what um what millennials want a lot of times and and what the new workforce wants and so paying attention to kind of the the challenges that they're facing in the way that they're approaching something in a different way uh, that's really what i've tried to focus on uh, like i said diversity is not a startup we've been around for about 95 years but it feels like one right now and um trying to pay attention to who those players are and and what they're doing in the space and uh, how they're actually shifting the the kind of boundaries at the end and shifting the frontier that that to me is what I've been paying attention to so um, Sometimes it's I mean they're startups. So they're small, you know, they're they're little but um, they wouldn't be names that are known But there's some local in Charlotte. There's some that I get exposed to uh, when I do kind of networking events and that sort of thing So I've been really trying to pay attention to that Before, before we wrap up, what do we think the uh, potential impacts are for companies that don't shift their current way of, of, of managing this and continue mm -hmm. to do the same thing, annual review, et cetera, the kind of things everyone's been through. What do you guys think the outcomes are going to be for the companies that don't shift and the potential impact that's going to have on their organizations? Yeah. Well, what happened to the dinosaurs? You know, I mean, <laughs> that's, um, that's what happens. You know, if you're a dinosaur, you don't stick around that too often, you know, uh, and the employees don't stick around. I don't think either. Um, I think you need to be able to be an organization that, that moves and shifts. Um, I think it's also important to think about the organization is where it needs to be. Um, you know, where, it, when, and when, and where it needs to be when it is there, you know, if, if, they're achieving success at this point in time right now, and this is working for them. They do need to have an eye on what's going to work in the future. And if they don't shift for the future, then, then they're not going to last around a long, very, not going to be around for a long time, but right now it might be okay for them, you know, for, for the success or the strategy that they're trying to achieve. So I think they won't stick around forever because change is the status quo now, isn't it? You know, that's kind of just the way things are. They're going to keep changing. Um, so that's kind of what I figured that, you know, what happened to the dinosaurs is going to happen to the dinosaurs when it comes to this kind of stuff too. In, in, <laughs> in honor of our uh, departed colleague, Jill and her nine year question, I'm going to, I'm going to put it in the nine year context. Yeah. So here's what's going to happen nine years from now, nine years from now, a large portion of organizations are going to move away from the annual review process into a more dynamic and collaborative evaluation of employees performance. But there will be a, a sizable percentage of companies that will hold out. They will not make the change. They will slowly increase their attrition because employees will not get what they need. They will hear more and more stories of other organizations that are innovating and valuing performance and are much more dynamic in terms of their own. I mean, we talked about this a lot in terms of pay, 
But I think more importantly for generations, actually it's about feedback. So pay is important, but pay is three to 5% in most cases of your annual salary. So material for some, not material for others. But what is critical, what I find with my team is they don't, the pay is actually secondary. They want yes, the it is, you're right. It's completely shifting. They want the conversation about what am I doing well? How do I get better? What opportunities are available to me so I can grow my skill set and increase my toolbox? Because in the future, skills are much, much, much more important than technical expertise. So it's, it's opportunities to learn and have that experiential learning, which can affect things like emotional intelligence. It can affect, that's where you're going to see people screaming for support. Um, but you'll see companies justify their own existence by saying, well, this is the way it's always worked. <laughs> and mm-hmm. they're going to blame other people for their circumstances because they weren't w- willing to make the necessary change. Uh, a good example of that in a completely different industry uh, is taxi drivers and Uber. So mm-hmm. Uber came as a result of a disruptive technology that completely transformed the taxi industry in most countries. And rather than innovate themselves, what have most taxi companies done? They fought Uber, tried to bar them out and complained about things that are really not relevant. So that's where I think you're going to see is those companies in our, you know, in in the HR field or in other industries that don't make the change are going to suffer in the long term. They may be around, but they're going to suffer and they're going to be complaining a lot because they will think that other people need to solve the problem for them. But ultimately it's within the hands of people who are watching this show, senior HR leaders, CEOs, boards of directors, they can help influence this change. Um, It's going to take time. It's going to be a little bit clunky along the way, but ultimately it's going with the trend. So either you make the change now and do it in a somewhat orderly fashion, or you're going to be forced to make the change later, or when you fix it, you're going to be digging from a much deeper hole than where you started from today. Yeah. We're seeing the trend now, aren't we? Everyone wants that quick progression in the organization. I certainly felt it as a, as a very young, the youngest director in the last company. I was like, I've got to wait a whole year to get some feedback. <laughs> no, I, I want to get promoted. I want to do more things, right? I was hungry to do it. And that did really frustrate me, really, really frustrating me. Dude. And I would get, you know, wait until the end of the year. Like, really? We could have this conversation. We're in, we have a, meet, a weekly meeting anyway. So give me the feed, give me the feedback in our one to one. We have a one to one once a week. Just tell me what you want to do. It always drives me mad. And um, you're right. And not people are not going to be part. You only have to look on LinkedIn now. The average time people are working at companies is getting lower and lower and lower and lower because mm-hmm. people are now hungry, just moving around. Like uh, when I first started in this, even for HR specifically, when I first started doing this when I was 17, literally 13 years ago, that HR leader is like four years average time or something along those lines, four to five years. Now it's like two years like a year so in some cases I speak, and moving around cons- consistently and it's not because of pay it's for opportunity experience. it's for opportunity mm-hmm. and experience yeah, and experience. challenge yeah. and, 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 and they're like oh Chris I mean, it's kind of, I'm like whenever I ask I always ask why did you leave I, I love asking that question I'm like why did you leave tell me wh- how, how did they manage to get you and it's always like oh new experience or I'm going to this new era new function or a new industry or you know, so, it's always a challenge and excitement or, or something new um, and a lot of times they weren't provided those opportunities in their own organization they, they, they right. couldn't, there's no, they, they couldn't move, they, companies didn't even give them the option to move to a different function or, you know, so you've got this incredible talent, but you're trying to keep it in one particular spot for the whole time and you wonder why people get disengaged. And I think that's directly linked as well to what we've discussed today. So I think that's a good point to wrap it up. <laughs> Otherwise we can go on for another hour about this topic. And at this point, yeah. you know, I want to ask you a question because we've got, you know, many your opportunity to ask questions to our audience one of the things we love, love doing is uh, is asking the audience you know what their thoughts are so if there's one question you could ask our audience and this is for your own feedback now it's your time to be selfish <laughs> what question would you have for our audience uh, i thought a lot a lot about this in, in terms of being able to ask a question to, out there to the ether and see what kind of results yeah. we get back um, I think the biggest one that, that I have recently is because we're introducing these core competencies and I'd be interested to know um, kind of an average, I guess, when people respond, but um, how much does the how play into somebody's overall performance um, in, in the organizations that they're in? You know, what's the percentage there or is there a factor in their performance management? I'm really interested to find out how organizations are putting that as part of their performance management process. You know, how much does the what count and how much does the how count um, in their in their practice? That'd be really Thank interesting you. to find out. Well, we always give everyone the warning that we, when we post this on LinkedIn, you are going to get a lot of, a lot of messages in your inbox. Mm-hmm. So you, you are warned <laughs> now yeah. so, uh, as well. Okay. So 
Well, look, that's all for today, guys. Deanne, really appreciate you taking the time out to share your insights and knowledge with us. It's always appreciated. We appreciate that. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This is not going to be a live episode, but either way, you're going to be listening to it. <laughs> so it's going to be very interesting. Uh, also, leave your comments below, guys, on LinkedIn, so we can then obviously um, feel free to message Deanne <laughs> personally. She's probably going to hate me for yeah. saying that. Uh, Matt, it was great for you, great joining us as well. Nice seeing you every week, as always, um, as well. Thank you for joining a bit of color and the nice paintings in the background for us. And uh, thank, you to, thank you to Jill, who's just disappeared to finish her accreditation. But um, we'll see you guys the same time next week. And uh, apart from that, we wish you all the best.